Okay, this is Jasmine for the Embassy of Peace and I'm seated in an apartment in Brussels, Belgium about to talk with a very, very fascinating man called um, Bernard Leta. Is that how we pronounce it? Leta. <laughs> and while he's written many books, we're here to interview him today on one which is called Money and Sustainability, The Missing Link. So welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm told by different sources that you're one of the top money men around as far as investigating how our world needs to change with her economic systems to make them work a little bit better and make them more sustainable, which is the title of your book. Would you like to just share from a moment a little about your background? Well, uh, it's by accident or late awareness that I actually uh, discovered that the common denominator in my work for 25 years had been money systems. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that I make a lot of money myself or that I uh, have uh, very senior levels of responsibility, but what's unique about it is the diversity. I believe I'm the only central banker who also managed offshore currency funds. It is unusual to be a professor of international finance and the president of electronic payment systems. They're two very different extremes. Or working with major multinationals and working with uh, developing countries. So you've been involved with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and also in the beginning formation of the Euro for the yes, EU? Yes, I was with the central bank in Belgium. And Belgium, by accident, got the, uh, the chairmanship of the, uh, the initiative to create a single European currency. Really, we don't want to spend time on your background except to say that you've um, had a lot of training over 25 years of very much focused on monetary systems. That's a common denominator of all a, my activities. Yes, as a common denominator and you've written many other books including books that um, bridge this information also with the Divine Feminine which I know some of our, our listeners will be fascinated by. But let's just get back to a report you did, the book Money and Sustainability sustainability, the missing link, and just perhaps come straight to the point and say, what do you feel needs to happen to strengthen our global economy? You talk in the book that our existing system is incomplete and it needs additional layers. So perhaps you can share a bit more on that. Well, what we have, the, the theoretical component of what uh, that justifies the strategy that I'm talking about is what are the conditions for stability for any complex flow network? Now, that sounds very abstract. Uh, any natural ecosystem is a complex flow network in which biomass circulates. Uh, an immune system in a human body is a complex flow network in which information flows. Uh, electrons are doing this in electrical distribution systems and money in an economy. And at a very general level, because we have many uh, data about natural ecosystems. I've been working with uh, Bob Ulanovic, uh, who is the specialist of uh, uh, ecosystems, quantitative ecosystems. Uh, he's been spending his entire life on measuring what happens in a natural ecosystem. And there's one thing that all natural ecosystems have in common. They are sustainable. Mm. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. Mm. So the question that we raised together was, what else do they have in common? And what's intriguing is that there is conditions on the structure of the network that are necessary for a sustainable system. And one of the key variables is the uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. And the other one is interconnectivity. Mm. Let me focus on diversity, because that is what's been missing in the field of economics. So, so just to clarify, hold that, don't lose that thought, but to clarify, you're basically saying for any system to be sustainable, whether it's economic, environmental or anything, that it does have a structure that um, uh, depends on the things you're about to explain. And if we any get the structure... Any complex flow network. Yes, and if we get the structure identified, you can apply it across the board to everything. Exactly. 
to every okay. complex flow network. Excellent. Right. <laughs> okay. okay, there are things that are not complex flow yeah. networks. Mm. Uh, a mountain, a rock is not mm. a yeah. complex flow yeah. network. Okay? Yeah, but human existence is. Human, human, <laughs> humans, uh, lots of our, our human systems are, mm. um, including, for example, blood distribution or, mm. or, or mm. immune systems. Mm. Okay, So uh, there are general rules, and one of them is that you need to have a minimum level of diversity and a maximum. You can overshoot. Mm. Uh, and this will depend on whether you are pushing efficiency. Uh, if you want to push efficiency very far, you will actually reduce diversity. Uh, and then what we're sacrificing is resilience, the capacity mm. for a system to adapt to a change in the environment or a change in the context in which things are evolving. So uh, a money system is a complex flow network in which money circulates, that is what an economy does, and we have been artificially keeping a single type of currency worldwide, everywhere. Uh, all our monies are created the same way. Even under the Soviet system, it was that way. There are all our money, modern money systems are created by bank debt. Uh, and uh, the only difference between the Soviet system and the capitalist system was that in the Soviet system, the shareholders were the government, while in uh, the capitalist system, that only happens when the banks get into enough trouble. Mm -hmm. Then the government takes them over mm -hmm. uh, for, for a while mm -hmm. to get them back in shape. Mm -hmm. uh, but the system is the same. And the consequence of that is, like any monoculture, it can be very efficient. The efficiency for circulating money is quite extraordinary today. Mm -hmm. uh, there are well over four trillion dollars exchanged per day in the foreign exchange markets, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, two percent of which are for all the goods and services being exchanged in the world, and ninety-eight percent are speculative. Mm -hmm. So the volume. The efficiency of processing volume is quite remarkable, mm. but it is fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had 425 countries that have gone through a uh, crash of uh, several types. One of them is a banking crash, like we had in 2007-2008. It can be a currency crash, like happened in the ruble or with the peso in Argentina, uh, or it can be a, uh, a governmental uh, debt mm. crisis like we have now in uh, Greece uh, or where is born in Spain. So uh, we are all, uh, these are simply three different phases of the same systemic mm. manifestation of instabilities. Mm. So that is why we, I believe we need to have a diversity in currency systems and we're actually having this process spontaneously emerging as we speak. Over the last 20 years, uh, they have been following more than 5,000 systems uh, that have emerged out of nowhere. There were two of them in 1986. Mm -hmm. So uh, people are reinventing money themselves. So you're talking now we're going into alternative things to run, run alongside of our existing system to strengthen it, yeah. adding the diversity. So, for example, the barter system. Barter systems are and you don't have a currency, mm. if you take it literally. Exactly. Uh, if you don't, when you take mm. it literally. Uh, most of what they call barter, commercial barter, is in fact a currency. Mm. Mm. Uh, they're they're mm. using an internal currency. Mm. Mm. whose value is supposed to be the same as the national currency. So that's one form. Mm. Uh, they were also talking about social purpose currencies, things like LETs, local exchange trading mm. systems, uh, things like time banking, uh, but also business to business mm. systems, mm. like we have the Weed in Switzerland. Mm. Uh, all these systems are different ways to provide a media of exchange uh, that is other than the conventional currency. And I call them complementary, not alternative, because an alternative would be uh, an alternative instead is when of, you don't need yeah, of. You know, instead you know, of. So uh, this is in addition to this adding is in parallel diversity. With. Yeah. Yes. There is a philosophical uh, basis behind that that actually is justified. We have actually been able to prove through to this work on, on the complexity theory that the insight of the Taoist uh, philosophy, of the, the need for a balance between yin and yang, as they call it, 
uh, of the yang being the more masculine type of energy, the yin being more a feminine type of energy, that you need a balance in these two types of energies for a system to be stable, to be, mm. stable, to be able to sustainable. So for our new agey sort of metaphysic listeners, it is basically, you could even sum it up, that the current economic problems can be that it's too patriarchal, too left brain, and we also need to balance it with a bit more um, matriarchal, divine feminine, right brain, intuitive, more flexible systems as well. Uh, I, if I may restate it slightly yeah, differently. Please do. Let me put it this way. Yes. If we take all patriarchal societies in history, Sumer, Babylon, Greece, Rome, and since the Renaissance and Western society, um, they all have the same money system. A monopoly of a centralized currency with interest. Interest was invented in Sumer uh, at the same time as the patriarchal society was emerging for the first time, we're talking 3200 BC, we're talking 5000 years of history here. And all those patriarchal societies have always tried and mostly succeeded in having a single currency, top down, controlled top down, with interest. So actually, an interest is a process of concentrating resources at the top. The mm. people who have a lot of resources and a lot of money automatically get more of it for the simple fact that the interest provides them mm -hmm. that flow. Mm -hmm. um, now, all matrifocal societies, and I'm using matrifocal and not matriarchal, mm. because a matriarchal society has never existed. Mm. Mm. A matriarchal society would be a society in which the male is reduced to a procreative role. That mm. would be there the have been form. a few tribes like that. <laughs> yes, but they were they have not been successful, successful. because it's out of balance. Yeah. Yes, exactly. They have not survived mm. a long mm. time. Mm. Uh, the the one example is the Amazons, mm. which is mythology. Mm. And have actually mm -hmm. never found an, an archaeological or, or, or a historical or, mm -hmm. or anthropological example mm -hmm. where, where people have mm -hmm. gone that far. Mm -hmm. That would be matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. uh, matrifocal societies have existed. Matrifocal society is a society that honors uh, feminine values. And the shortcut mm -hmm. to find where you are is look at the image of the divine. Mm -hmm. A society that uh, has, well, at the extreme form, a single god uh, with a big beard who has created it all without a girlfriend, you're probably in a patriarchal society, <laughs> okay? Mm. Uh, while if you look at societies like uh, Egypt, dynastic Egypt, um, where Isis was the big mm. player, and Osiris was the poor guy who got in trouble and mm. that she saved repeatedly out of love, um, the period of the 10th to the 13th century in Western Europe which is a period where the cathedrals were all built, and they were all built for a lady, mm -hmm. okay? for, typically for the black Madonnas mm -hmm. of that time, So, uh, which is the feminine in her own power. Mm -hmm. So in these societies, both in Egypt and in Central Middle Ages, from the 10th to the 13th century in Western Europe, we've had a, mon a monetary ecosystem, two different types of money. Mm -hmm. You had a patriarchal type currency, which can be saved and accumulated uh, with the same rules as the patriarchal society with interest and all that. And you do have a second type of currency, which is bottom up, mm. which is not scarce, which is insufficiency mm. and which has no interest and has in fact has uh, uh, even the more sophisticated forms where that there was a penalty on accumulating money. So it would be a pure medium of exchange. Mm. It cannot be stored, it cannot be stored of value. Now, in these societies, the dynamics, the economic dynamics were very different mm. because everybody had money. Mm. Even the slaves mm. in Egypt mm. had money, mm. um, which never was thinkable for in, uh, you know, in, in harder uh, mm. patriarchal societies. Uh, so it has also been a period where ordinary people lived at a high, very high level uh, standard of living. Mm. Um, and the, I think that we are now, with the technologies that we have now, uh, these, in, in, in the information age, I see the modern forms of the complementary currencies as a manifestation of uh, 
the first of all the technology that's involved mm -hmm. and number two the values that are behind it mm -hmm. this, this emergence of feminine energy uh, which takes that form mm -hmm. which is actually manifesting in the form of a currency mm -hmm. uh, that is of a yin nature to mm -hmm. put it back with uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Taoist uh, philosophy mm -hmm. and when you have these two systems in the, in the balance very different things become possible and much of my work has been to show a kind of monetary innovations that would solve different types of problems from the ranging from aging of society which we don't have solutions for to uh, making people think long term like corporations think long term which is uh, would be necessary for having a sustainable development strategy on a planetary level uh, to uh, well, um, job creation in, a, in an information age and all that stuff. All, every one of the problems that are left unsolved in the industrial period that we're now mm -hmm. ending uh, can be addressed with these monetary innovations. Mm. So people, if they want to look at all the background and the arguments, can read your book, Money and Sustainability, The Missing Link, and... And, and look at uh, the arguments behind everything. But from that, what do you feel now is viable solutions that can can strengthen the global economy with these complementary um, realities um, that give a greater diversity and make it more sustainable? What What do you feel we need to focus on now? Well, what would you like what to is, see happen? What is happening? as we speak, without anybody having to convince anybody mm. to do some things, is uh, local currencies. Uh, that is useful, mm -hmm. but it is not scalable. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of monetary innovations that are currently emerging spontaneously tend to be local, therefore small scale, um, involve about 500 active people per unit, per system, uh, and uh, that's fine. I compare them to um, capillary vessels for your blood distribution. Capillary vessels are great. They give you color, they, they make you, uh, keep you warm. But if you're counting on that to save you from a heart attack, you're, you're, you're naive. Mm. We need systems that can scale. Mm -hmm. so, so go global, where well, everyone is Well, that's one one of the currency proposals I have is a global currency that's nobody's national currency. Mm -hmm. And that would make it profitable to think long term mm -hmm. when, you, when you account in that currency. Mm -hmm. But there are other systems on a smaller scale than that and global uh, business to business systems. If you were talking about uh, jobs, uh, jobs equals in fact small and medium sized enterprises, 85 to 90 percent of all private jobs or in small businesses um, and the problem of small businesses is cash flow mm. uh, when they sell something to IBM they need to wait 90 days or 120 days to get paid and if you buy something you need to pay cash mm. Mm. so uh, and when you go to the bank they say you're too small to be interesting mm. so they end up being strangulated to mm. death and that's a problem everywhere so we are, have solutions for that. We have solutions for addressing to, to inject uh, working capital in networks of small businesses. Uh, they are already successful in Brazil and in Uruguay at this time. And we're in the process of introducing them in other places, including in Europe and Latin America. So uh, different issues require different uh, currencies. Um, let me give you another example, which is the aging of society. Uh, it's clear that uh, the baby boomers uh, are going to basically disrupt the entire social program mm -hmm. uh, on around pensions and health and healthcare uh, worldwide. There are different timing for it. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan and Italy are two countries that are the fastest right now meeting these issues. And what's interesting in Japan, particularly, which has been the most active country in addressing that issue, they were the first one to hit that wall already in 1990-1995 of the aging uh, population. And what they have done as a solution is a, a Furiakipo currency system, 
which is about 487 systems are now operational in, in Japan, just addressing that one issue. Mm. So we're dealing with different currencies for different purposes. Mm. Uh, how they work can be explained in detail. Uh, I don't think this is uh, the best time to do so. But uh, what I'm saying is the name an issue and we can actually design a currency that provides a motivation system mm. to address it, mm. to correct that particular problem. And then the common result would be actually a monetary ecosystem. Mm. And a monetary ecosystem has different systems of different scales. Mm. Um, there is a reality at the very large level, the global one, and there is another level and a, and a neighborhood level, mm. and all the places in between. Mm. And yes, there is a possibility of having too many. Mm. One can mm. overshoot, mm. but we're so far from that, I don't think we're concerned about that today. Mm. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that uh, the, the but the problem if you have too many currencies will be inefficiency, mm. the not enough energy, not enough volume of total flow to throughput. Uh, that's the risk if you overshoot. But if you shoot for efficiency, which is the only criteria that's been used so far, you will actually sacrifice the diversity necessary mm. to have the resilience mm. for adapting in a society. So on one level you're also saying that these complementary systems would really bring the power back to the people, put it back in the hands of the people so that they can take care of their needs and have less government involvement. People, are, the government of course can be involved because government needs taxes to provide infrastructure and all the rest of it, but it just gives a far greater of choice, more power for creativity back to the people to um, work side by side with governments to meet the needs of the people more effectively. Uh, yes, you're right. And, and, um, you have been making one assumption which happens to be a key uh, why is it that the quote unquote national currencies are so powerful, so necessary that everybody prefers to be paid in that currency? And the answer is precisely taxes. Mm. The government, when it chooses to require taxes payable only in a currency that the government itself cannot create, mm. but that the private banking system creates, it gives the power to the banking system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think governments uh, should be aware of that, mm -hmm. that they have a lot of power by choosing which type of currency they decide to accept in payment of taxes. Mm -hmm. um, if they choose to have a single currency, then only the currency created by banks, it's going to be the banks who run the show mm -hmm. and not governments. Mm -hmm. Why would government not, for example, at the city level, why would a city government not, and take an extreme case like Greece, where cities have 50% unemployment, and if you keep trying to do everything with a single currency, you're going to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to work. Why would a city not issue a currency and require a payment of taxes in that currency? If you want to live in that city, mm -hmm. you need to bring 25 units at the end of the year and here's the list of activities we want you to perform mm. in order to earn these mm. these, these units mm. and for example it could be time based mm. okay um, and if there are people who don't want to do these things that's fine uh, they can buy these units from people who do more of it mm. <laughs> all those mm. activities so you can actually give a balanced system mm. and give power back to governments at the city level. Mm. So yes, we are actually talking about for the first time making money democratic mm. and democratically controlled. As I travel the world and I see a lot in different countries from India to South America to Russia and other places that when the people don't trust the government, when the people feel the governments are intrinsically corrupt or the payments mm -hmm. of taxes aren't used for their highest good or they don't see benefit from their taxes so that there's no improving in infrastructure, we end up having a black market economy. And 
And so that's a whole different game again. But what you're suggesting is by bringing back um, it, making it more local, where it's by the people, for the people, and more transparent, because transparency is a big issue with the global economy right now. Um, deregulation or re-regulation, all sorts of things are being discussed that aren't my field of expertise, but mm -hmm. are yours. Then we can clean up a lot of issues mm -hmm. that have been worrying people, because mm -hmm. people don't want to pay taxes often to, they tell me, to governments where they can't see a benefit for their money or any infrastructure changing. So uh, what you're suggesting is uh, systems that will really even eliminate that problem. Yes, yes. And one way, the, the, the technological breakthrough is going to be with mobile phones, mm. uh, which are going to be the payment systems of the future. There is no reason in the world that you should have one single currency on your mobile phone. Mm. You can have different mm. systems. Mm. Now, the the capacity to self-organize, I would say, I claim that a currency should always be a commons. And commons need to be managed as a commons, which is different mm. from mm. other systems, you know. Um, and we know that one of the things is the need for hyper-democracy, the capacity for people to, in, to govern their own currency system, okay? And that doesn't, that requires, one of the conditions of that is actually having the democracy in that field mm -hmm. and therefore transparency to the users. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and we now have the means to do that. Mm -hmm. We have the means to do that. So, I believe that we have the, the tools for addressing any one of our issues uh, which would be uh, much more self controlled by the communities themselves who actually decide to participate in a particular currency system. Mm. You're not obliged to do mm. so. Mm. Right? I mean, in some cases you may be, mm. in the case of the government uh, mm. uh, issue, issued currency, but in the terms of the, 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 the civil purposes, mm. the, uh, the social purposes, this is just a system that people do create themselves. So would it be radical to suggest that while our governments and global economies are sorting themselves out so that um, they do perhaps operate with more sustainability that the man in the street, our common person, could also open to more innovative ways of being within the community so that their needs are met as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And your book, um, The Money and Sustainability, The Missing Link, goes into these corollary or complementary systems in greater detail, which may yes, inspire shows people. shows examples also. at all levels. So it yes. shows examples on all levels how people could apply that. Mm -hmm. Because there seems to be a revolution in consciousness around the world mm -hmm. where people are saying, I can't afford to wait for governments to work it out because they don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And there is a need for consciousness. There is a need for holding an intention that we get solutions in our world mm -hmm that create win-win situations, mm -hmm. win for the individuals and also win for communities and the planetary system. And these are the sort of um, systems that will be sustainable because they've got a common denominator in that they operate for the highest good of all. Mm -hmm. And adding more fluidity, which is tend tending a, a, a feminine principle to it by people being a bit more creative and innovative, mm -hmm. then that will complement our existing patriarchal yes. system that tends to run most motivated by other agendas, greed, and, mm -hmm. you know, things that aren't always operating for the highest good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The tools are now available to provide incentive schemes that are designed by people themselves mm -hmm. uh, for getting activities performed that otherwise wouldn't happen spontaneously. Yes. And there's a new system in business now where businesses are aware that if they reward their employees more from profit incentives or shares in companies, etc., that the people deliver a lot better in mm -hmm. business as well, rather yeah. than it being a top-down system, as you said, it's mm -hmm. a bottom-up system, and that means those type of businesses that are doing that are thriving as well. Mm -hmm. So we're already seeing examples of this. But, you know, I'd like to complete our interview with two questions. One, on a global level, what do you suggest, um, as briefly as you can, in a nutshell, because people can read your book, but what do you suggest that the global governments need to be doing to, to really stabilise our economic systems globally? And then the second one is, what about the man in the street? What can the common person do? What do you feel is best on both levels? 
big question. Let me start with the second one. Um, ordinary people. Uh, I believe that uh, people can gather uh, in communities. A currency is a medium of exchange that a community agrees upon. Mm -hmm. So by taking the opportunities of self-organize and uh, create systems that address specifically your own priorities. Don't do this alone. This is mm -hmm. not a, you know, a big boy mm -hmm. scheme. It is a community process. And everything we learn about community processes are relevant here on how to manage these things. But there are now models available to address every one of the issues that are a priority, that are becoming pri huge priorities, all the way mm -hmm. from job creation to mm -hmm. elderly care to environmental issues and name it and all mm. these things that are not solved currently mm. uh, because one claims that there's not enough money mm. well uh, there's not enough what kind of money mm. if you have a monopoly and given mm. that monopoly to a particular group um, they may decide to create the money for their own purposes not for the ones that society needs but we can complement that mm. with other systems mm. that are specifically tailored mm. to the needs of it. We're already seeing examples of this in communities for vertical gardening, where mm -hmm. people are growing fruit and vegetables, taking what they need and then passing the rest out through the community mm -hmm. in exchange mm -hmm. for something else. Yes. And that's working wonderfully, even in New York City ghettos. Mm -hmm. um, so people are able to provide food for each other, mm -hmm. different agricultural methods in mm -hmm. the cities mm -hmm. for basic things like food, which everyone needs. Exactly. Yes. So exactly. then, yeah. But you need to create an economy. Mm. And that's what a currency does. It mm. creates a separate economy. Mm. But the currency where there's could dynamics be food. Over, pardon? The currency could yeah, be food. The, or time. Yeah, or time. Or time to grow it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so in mm. other words, there. Uh, mm. But so if not? you try to do this mm. with a single currency, mm. you will never mm. have, will never make sense economically mm. in a single currency mm. world mm. to grow a salad on, on the roof. Mm. You know, when you have uh, 20 miles out there, you have square square miles of stuff that you can grow salads mm. on mm. in a huge way. Mm. But so, that puts the power back in the hands of the multi-corporations rather than in the hands of the people. That's why I say you need a currency yeah. to make those things separate. Yes. Otherwise, yes. it will never work. Yes. Okay? You cannot make it, you cannot do it mm. purely on a single currency standard. I have no concern that uh, corporations can do the right thing at the condition that they think long term. Mm. I am concerned when it is the priority is to have maximized the next two or three quarters mm. profits. Mm. Uh, and anything beyond that is not of interest to us. Mm. Uh, and that is what's happening now, mm. and that is also programmed by the mm. currency. Mm. Any currency with a positive interest rate uh, makes long term thinking uneconomic. Mm. It does not make sense mm. to think long term. Mm. And there is a currency, which I call the Terra, which is backed by a basket of the major commodities uh, that are in part of a global trade that would make it profitable to think long term. Mm. Okay? Can, can you tell us then a little bit more about the Terra? I, I, I'm sure you write about it in the mm -hmm. book Money and Sustainability, The Missing Link. But just uh, people love the idea of someone saying there is a solution, there is a currency, it will allow you to think long term, it is sustainable. So tell us more about that. Well, it is uh, a business to business system, which is where the currency is backed by physical inventory of the major commodities of the global system. So it, I see it as a transition tool in the long term. We need to go beyond that. But now what's urgent is to have corporations think long term. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you have uh, a negative interest rate, uh, cost for keeping money uh, in an account, the opposite of what we have now, because when you have money in an account, you get more money, interest. When you have a uh, parking fee on money, uh, you actually, if the rationale will be that you need, the future is more important than the present. Mm. Mm. So it reverses the whole process of uh, discounting the future 
And the consequence is that something that is in the future becomes more important than the immediate profits. So are you like saying then that, that instead of storing money and accumulating money, money then becomes, there's an incentive with negative interest to keep money circulating like a that river is, with a long-term reality of getting investments in other ways than just accumulating cash? One of the features is what you just said in terms of the activation uh, that basically people don't store value in the form of money, but mm -hmm. uh, or in that kind of money. Because mm -hmm. don't forget, this is all complementary to the existing mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. You still have your dollars and your pounds and your mm -hmm. euros if, uh, to do the stuff that you do now. Okay, but by using a currency that's neutral, that is nobody's national currency, and which has actually represents the purchasing power in the mm. long term, which mm. is the basket of commodities, that's how we measure inflation, mm. right? Mm. So in other words, by having the, the, the commodities themselves being the unit of account, the mm. basket of it, uh, you actually have a more stable currency in terms of value. Mm. And it can compare results around the world. Mm. And at the same time, by having the cost of storing these commodities, because there's a cost, mm. physical cost of storing physical things, uh, you need to have an insurance, you need to have uh, a guardian, you need to have a storage facility. These things cost money. Uh, therefore, there's an, actually a penalty uh, of accumulating that currency. There is a storage cost. And then when you use a negative interest rate for discounting the future, you actually the future becomes more important than the present to mm. reverse the whole process. Mm. It becomes profitable to think long term mm. for businesses. Mm. Uh, and I think that is a precondition mm. for us to evolve in towards a, a sustainable mm. uh, planet where, where, where they reverse the priorities of corporations that are actually choosing mm. a currency that makes sense for the shareholders mm. to, to think long term. Mm. need to reverse that, because what they currently do. A lot of our economic decisions aren't always for the highest good of our environment as True. well because we do think short term in profit making and what yeah. the bottom line is rather than long term in sustainability. So obviously this issue is interconnected mm -hmm. and yet a lot of big business may say but it's too expensive to be so environmentally conscious or you know that's going to eat away too substantially initially on our bottom line. But this is the sort of thinking that people are saying we now have to go beyond mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. look at operating systems on the planet that are good for Mother Earth, mm -hmm. good for the people, good mm -hmm. for the environment, good economically across the board. So what do you feel then um, is the best message you can give for our future globally and for our people? I think that the means exist today and they did not exist in previous generations to actually provide, give the power back to the people on the priorities that they want to address. Mm -hmm. And a currency provides a tool to provide, to give an incentive, mm -hmm. motivation system for these things to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, I see this in the, as a transition. I think that, uh, in, it was in Star Trek, Dr. Spock, who said in 2400, we don't have any money. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody does things because they're passionate about what they're passionate about, and they, they do this to develop themselves and develop their community. I think he's right in mm -hmm. 2400. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Maybe we, we can do it earlier. We, yeah. we need to have a transition tool. Mm -hmm. I think going over from where we are now to that mm. in one step is not going mm. to happen. Mm. And what I'm talking about are transition tools. Mm. Mm. Transition tools that actually provide motivations for doing the right thing mm. uh, with the priorities that you're just mentioning. In other words, things that work for everybody. And you can motivate people where they are mm. from now, mm. at the level mm. where of, the, of consciousness where they are now. And by doing this, provide the press preparatory steps to get rid of all money, mm. not mm. all the you know mm. the conventional money, and, mm. but also complementary currencies will not mm. be necessary. I see it as uh, a crutch. Mm. We have had our feminine leg, the yin side of society, completely weakened for thousands of years. We need to rebuild it with yin currencies. Mm. 
And when the two systems are in balance, you may get rid of all of it mm. and mm. go for that nirvana world mm. <laughs> that Dr. Spock was talking about. Mm. But what I'm talking about is how do you get from here to there? Mm. And I think we need the new tools that are available for doing that. And I think with all your research and your book, Money and Sustainability, it, what it will do is hopefully provide a little bit of fertilizer for more individual creativity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as people come back into looking at their community, their contribution mm -hmm. to the community. How can we run the community so that everyone's needs are met while all the other global issues bubble along with the big corporations, etc., mm -hmm. behind the scenes? And you've offered some structure you've offered some insight which would really just inspire more personal mm -hmm. creativity which almost takes us back to tribal cultures where some of the tribes have like I know the Mamos in, in the Sierra Nevadas in Colombia and you've spent time with them as have I and everybody in that community um, self-selects a job mm. to do that is they are happy to do, they're skilled at doing with the attitude that this is good for my community mm -hmm. so I do it willingly and with joy. Mm -hmm. And so they can be a very happy cashless society where everybody's needs are met. One person may specialise in farming, another in textiles mm -hmm. and, and together as a community they meet regularly, they talk about their needs and they have a completely mm -hmm. different system of operation that has kept them in harmony with each other mm -hmm. and Mother Earth for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we how do you scale that up? Yeah, now you've got to scale it up on a global level. We need to make this happen mm. within societies that don't have this tradition. Mm. But step by step, mm. within, within step each community. First mm. the individual, What those really. currencies would do is mm. actually provide a tool to, mm. to motivate these mm. things to happen. Exactly. And then at a certain point, yes, you're right, we can. I, I don't think we're going back to a tribal level. No. We are having, at the same time, the tribal level and the global level. Mm. We need the global systems and we need local level mm. systems. And both mm. together mm. can actually get us mm. into mm. a reality where, where what you're describing becomes doable mm. and becomes oper operable. Because communities really are tribes. And the mm -hmm. question is, can we take the best of all systems we've in, mm -hmm. witnessed in the world and blend it all together? Mm -hmm. So obviously there's some things that don't work and some things that do work, mm -hmm. but it goes back to people being willing and open to um, be more self-responsible um, perhaps in the way we're running our communities, mm -hmm. more in self-mastery and more community orientated as well. Yes, these complementary currencies would be training tools, mm -hmm. transition training tools mm -hmm. to behavior patterns mm -hmm. that we are lost. Mm -hmm. And once they're back in place, then you can throw away all the crutches mm -hmm. and so you, go there. So you can actually see a world without any money as we know? Yes, in 2400. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure all those who love Star Trek would agree. And, you know, I saw a documentary not too long ago and William Shatner was saying all those baby boomers who watched the early Star Trek with all the pretend mechanisms for medicine mm -hmm. have now grown up to be doctors mm -hmm. and scientists and have created those very tools. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a lot to be said with mm -hmm. the ideas put forward in, in Star Trek. So. <laughs> Well, it's been fascinating to talk to you, and I do like to um, to recognize so many experts in their fields around the world, and on behalf of the Embassy of Peace, it's nice to share your insight and your expertise on the economy um, and the global financial situation. I'm in no way an expert myself, and I hope the questions of, uh, we've asked have been suitably intelligent, a little different perhaps from an economist, but... Well, you know, we are looking at it from from a, a more community, local level mm. too. There are never stupid questions, only stupid answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we will leave it. So we're inviting everyone, come on, be a bit more creative. Let's look yeah. after our community in different ways while our planet continues to weave, reweave all her structures so they do operate for the good of all. So thank you, Bernard. It's been wonderful to talk to you today. Thank you for having me.